Good morning, everybody. If you have your Bibles, I'd like you to turn to Luke chapter 13. Luke chapter 13. Just wanted to thank all of you that came to the memorial service, uh, Sydney's memorial, last Thursday night. Uh, the place was completely packed. A lot of young people here. And uh, yeah, just uh, kind of a mixed time. She was only 22 years old, but it was a, it was a good time to hear and remember her life and just talk about the faithfulness of God, how when we're weak, he is strong and uh, he carries us through. And uh, so we did a, uh, a balloon release out in the parking lot uh, at the end of the service and just a real special time honoring Sydney. How many of y'all were here? Some of you, yeah, well, there's quite a few. So, uh, yeah, I was called a conservative hippie this week. <laughs> Said, uh, when are you getting your hair cut? My daughter's in town this weekend, so I'm gonna get my hair cut this afternoon. <laughs> so I won't be a hippie anymore anyway, so. <laughs> uh, Let's pray and we'll get started. Father, thank you for your word, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for the kingdom of God. And Father, today as we go through your word, as you describe the kingdom, we pray, Lord, that you'll give us an ability to receive the truth and the reality of that kingdom and be encouraged, Lord. Lord, speak to each of our hearts today, we pray in Jesus' name. Everybody say amen. amen. The title of this message today is The Unstoppable Kingdom of God. The Unstoppable Kingdom of God. Of God. Oh, how we have tried since Christ came to stop the coming and the growth of the kingdom of God, and how over and over again it only served to make the kingdom grow. If you remember last week, we ended with a great miracle about a woman who had been bent over, crippled for 18 years, and how Jesus healed her on the Sabbath day. And the religious leaders of that day were like, hey, you could have healed her six other days of the week. Why did you choose the Sabbath day? And they, again, plotted how they could kill him. And in verse 17, it says, when he said this, all his opponents were humiliated when Jesus talked about, hey, you'll, you'll water your donkey on the Sabbath day. Why won't you heal a woman that's been tormented by Satan and bent over for 18 years? And when they heard this in verse 17, it says they were, his opponents were all humiliated, but the people were delighted with all the wonderful things he was doing. The reality is, though, you guys, is that the opponents of Christ were the power brokers of the day. And while some of the common people and the poor were believing, the ushering in of a great kingdom by a powerful Messiah was frankly not occurring. Try to imagine with me how difficult it was, how it was becoming so difficult for his own disciples. And here in the book of Luke, we're only a few weeks at this time from the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. It is incredibly difficult to stand for Christ 
when many times you are a mocked minority. How many of you know what I'm saying is true? How difficult it is to stand for Christ when you stand as one of the mocked minority. And those disciples increasingly were seeing a contradiction in what they believed all their life about a Messiah who was going to come and rule and reign. And this Jesus who claimed to be the Messiah, and in fact just the opposite seemed to be occurring. Even though he was doing great miracles and great crowds were following, the people in power were turning towards hatred and plotting how they could kill him. And increasingly, this contradiction in the minds of the disciples was, I'm sure, tormenting them. So in verse 18, Jesus shares a different view of the kingdom of God. I want you to see this view, and I want you to see how absolutely true the words of Christ are as he presents this idea of the kingdom of God. And I want us to be humbled by it today, of the greatness of the kingdom of God and the power and the unstoppability of the kingdom of God. Look with me in verse 18. Je when then Jesus asked, what is the kingdom of God like? What shall I compare it to? It is like a mustard seed, which a man took and planted in his garden. It grew and became a tree, and the birds of the air perched in its branches. Again, he said, what shall I compare the kingdom of God to? It is like a yeast that a woman took and mixed into a large amount of flour until it worked all through the dough. I want you to notice the kingdom of God has small beginnings. Can y'all say that with me? The kingdom of God has small beginnings. In fact, he says it's like a mustard seed. You see, in Matthew 13, 31, Jesus said this, his parable was described by Matthew, and he says, the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed which a man took and planted in his field. Though it is the smallest of all your seeds, yet when it grows, it is the largest of garden plants and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and perch in its branches. You see, the mustard seed is not the smallest seed known today, but it is the smallest seed used by the Palestinian farmers and gardeners. And under favorable conditions, this herb and this plant could reach 10 feet in its height. Planted as an herb with a tiny, tiny seed, the smallest herb seed that they planted in their garden became this large bush, a tree, that the birds loved to come and land in and eat the little mustard seeds. Smallest, the smallest seed. You see, he was telling them the kingdom of God was to have a small, almost invisible start from a power and human kingdom standpoint. In John 18, 36, Jesus, when questioned by Pilate if he was the king of the Jews, he replied this, My kingdom is not of this world, but is from another place. A spiritual kingdom for this present age has its rulership in the hearts of men, women, boys, and girls. And even though it is small in its beginnings, the kingdom of God, Jesus says, will grow into the largest of all the garden plants. It will have massive influence. 
It will influence the entire world. Jesus prophesies. In the book of Daniel, I don't know how many of you ever read the book of Daniel. It's, it's an amazing book. I want to encourage you to read the book of Daniel. It's a book of prophecy. It's, a, it's an extraordinary book of prophecy because Daniel literally describes kingdoms that are coming in the future and what they will be like. And then you get to read further on in the Old Testament and see how those kingdoms actually unfolded exactly like he prophesied at this time. And listen to what he says in Daniel chapter 2, verse 31. King Nebuchadnezzar had this dream. And Daniel pro interpreted it. He said, you looked, O king, and there before you stood a large statue, an enormous, dazzling statue, awesome in appearance. The head of the statue was made of pure gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of baked clay. While you were watching, a rock was cut out, but not by human hands. It struck the statue on its feet of iron and clay and smashed them. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were broken to pieces. At the same time, it became like chaff, a threshing floor in the summer. The wind swept them away without leaving a trace. But the rock that struck the statue became a huge mountain that filled the whole earth. And he went on to prophesy that the kingdom of God will rule over all the earth one day and all the great nations and kingdoms of the world will be crushed and blown away like the chaff of the wind. And Jesus was alluding to this great kingdom. But it had such small beginnings. Imagine with me. Jesus Christ one solitary life. This essay written, written by Dr. James Allen Francis in 18, 1926. Listen to what he says. Here is a man who was born in an obscure village, the child of a peasant woman. He grew up in another village. He worked in a carpenter shop till he was 30. Then for three years... He was an itinerant preacher. Listen to this with me. Try to imagine. He never owned a home. He never wrote a book. He never held an office. He never had a family. He never went to college. He never put his foot inside a big city. He never even traveled 200 miles from the place where he was born. He never did one of the things that usually accompany greatness. He had no credentials but himself. While still a young man, the tide of popular opinion turned against him. His friends ran away. One of them denied him. He was turned over to his enemies. He went through the mockery of a trial. He was nailed upon a cross between two thieves. While he was dying, his executioners gambled for the only piece of property that he had on earth, his coat. When he was dead, he was laid in a borrowed grave through the pity of a friend. Nineteen long centuries have come and gone. And today, he is a centerpiece of the human race and the leader of the column of progress. I'm far within the mark when I say that all the armors that ever marched all the navies that were ever built, all the parliaments that ever sat, and all the kings that ever reigned, put together, have not affected life of man upon this earth as powerfully as this one solitary life. The kingdom of God is like a mustard seed, the smallest of all seeds. 
but it's going to grow, Jesus said, into the largest of all herbal plants. It's going to be great. And as we think about today, 2,000 years later, think about those beginnings and think about this. Christianity today is the largest faith practiced in the world. From that beginning, from that uneducated, homeless man, never owned a home, never had any credentials, today, Christianity is the largest faith in the world. 95% of the world's population presently have part of the Bible or all of the Bible in their own language. 90% of all tribes have had an opportunity to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. Ethiopia claims to have something around 35 million Christians. About 50 million plus Christians are in China now. Did you know that Cuba has 50 Christian denominations operating under Fidel Castro? It's estimated that about 65,000 people profess to give their lives to Christ daily somewhere in the world. And about 1,500 new churches start every week around the world. The kingdom of God is like a mustard seed. The smallest beginning. But it's going to grow to influence the entire world. You see, Christianity advances in the name and in reality, but it grows invisibly and hidden by Christians who permeate society. That's where real change comes. In the hearts of men and women who come to know the Messiah and the spiritual kingdom of God. And it permeates and it spreads and it grows and it develops. And it has from that little beginning. I can imagine those disciples thinking, what am I doing? And I can imagine as we go through Luke here towards the end and the crucifixion and, and they ran scared to death. Now my life is going to be over and for what? If only they could see how the kingdom of God has changed the course of history and moved around the entire world. And the Bible says that when everyone has had the opportunity to know and hear the gospel, then the physical kingdom of God will come. And I get excited when it says 95% of all of the world has a part or all of the scripture in their own language. We're almost there. Hallelujah. Can you all say the kingdom of God is unstoppable? The kingdom of God will influence and is and has influenced the entire world. Just when we think we're going to be absorbed in godlessness, God's kingdom raises up from within and people begin to be moved. There's just something about the kingdom of God that can't be defeated. Because it's a kingdom that's supernatural. It's a kingdom that's eternal. It's the kingdom of almighty God. Now, not only does the kingdom have small beginnings, and not only will the kingdom eventually and is influencing the entire world, but I want you to see something today. The kingdom will change you from the inside out. You know, Revelation, the book of Revelation 11, 15, 
just to talk about it influencing the entire world. Listen to what it says. The seventh angel sounded his trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven which said, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. I want to ask you, what side of the kingdom do you want to be on? I want to be the one that's looking forward to the kingdom of God. We're on the other side of it, and there's no denying what Jesus prophesied has come completely true. Just as he said, that itinerant, homeless preacher who just had a few men following him, who even after he rose from the dead, there were only about 500 followers, it says in 1 Corinthians, and they, they were still hanging on, clinging on. It seemed like such a failure. And it has grown to influence the entire world. Look with me in verse 20. What shall I compare the kingdom of God to? It is like yeast that a woman took and mixed into a large amount of flour until it worked all the way through the dough. A yeast that a woman put, took and, and mixed into a large amount of flour until it worked all the way through the dough. It will change you from the inside out. Yeast is a single cell organism that converts fermentable sugars in dough into carbon dioxide. This causes the dough to expand or rise as gas forms pockets or bubbles. How many of you have ever worked with yeast? And, uh, we got a cook back there, yeah, that really knows about yeast. It's really interesting when you see what yeast does because you put it in there and you mix it all in and, and you smash it all down and then you come back and that dough has just expanded. And then don't you squish it down one more time to make it expand even more? It mixes all in there. And, it, and that single cell organism goes and, 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 and buds and it, and it just rapidly spreads throughout all that dough. It influences every cell and begins to change it and begins to expand it. It permeates every bit of that dough. Hallelujah, and boy, bread tastes good <laughs> when it's, that yeast has done its work and a good cook knows what they're doing with that yeast, which is not me, okay? But Jesus is describing something here. It starts small in you too. It starts small in you too. And we have such an instant society and we, we have a theology that wants instantaneous transformation. But I want you to know something. Jesus never taught it was going to be instantaneous. He taught it was going to begin like a little bacteria of yeast that goes into that lump of dough and begins its work and begins to permeate every cell, every fiber of the spirit of that person. I don't want you to be discouraged today because the kingdom of God seems like it's just moving too slow in you. Or these glorious testimonies of people being instantaneously changed and, and never going back don't apply to you. Or things that are so deeply ingrained in you, you just can't seem to overcome or you can't seem to get a breakthrough on it. And you question and wonder, is the kingdom of God in me? I want to encourage you today. Yes, indeed, if you put your faith in Jesus Christ. And there's something that makes you know that. Because the Spirit of God within you is always drawing, always compelling, always reaching for you. It's like that yeast is always trying to permeate. 
So many times in my years of struggle with depression as a Christian, I've wondered, are you there, Lord? Are you, are you working, Lord? Why am I this way? Why aren't things changing like I want them to change? Anybody like me? <laughs> and then it's like the Lord begins as I, as I stop for a moment and pray and read his word, and, and, and it's amazing. I begin to realize, what is it in me that just keeps yearning for God? What is it in me that I just can't walk away and just go do something completely different to try some other kind of solution? And then it hits me. It's because he's in me. That yeast is in me. <laughs> and that yeast is faithful to do its purpose. And it's committed to bud and to grow and to permeate that whole lump of dough. <laughs> Are you hearing me this morning? Just like Jesus said, the external kingdom, start with the smallest beginning and grows to influence the entire world until the kingdom of God physically returns. So he says it'll be for those who put their faith in him. The smallest beginning like a yeast in a lump of dough. But that yeast will begin its work. How many of you know what I'm saying is true? How many of you know that in your worst time as a Christian, you just tried to go back to the old life, but yet you, something was different? It wasn't the same anymore. And something you knew, you just were changed somehow. And it kept drawing you back, even in spite of your own mind and your own reason. It's because you belong to him. Can you say, thank God I belong to him? <laughs> Hallelujah. Do you know the Bible says? Listen to what it says. In 2 Corinthians Chapter 4, verse 16. It says, Therefore, do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. He's at work. He's transforming. He's saturating and permeating and influencing He's moving in every circumstance to influence you, that lump of dough, and to bring the kingdom of God into every cell, every fiber of your being. He's faithful. He says, for our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. The unseen is the kingdom of God within you. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Listen to what Jesus promised in John chapter 14. He said, verse 15, he says, if you love me, You'll obey what I command, and I will ask the Father, and he'll send you another counselor to be with you forever. Can you all say forever? <laughs> He's not going to come and go with your lackadaisical ways. No, he's faithful. He's going to be with you forever. The spirit of truth. You know, we did a training this week on addiction at the Prov. I did a training. And in this thing I was teaching on, it says the first consequence of addiction, the, the first uh, thing that, the first casualty of addiction 
is truth. Think about it. It's truth. And the Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth. And boy, when you've got the spirit of truth within you, and then you try to con and connive and manipulate to turn back to your old life, I'm telling you what, it's going to grate against the spirit of God that's been placed within you. And it's not going to be the same. Amen? Can you say, thank God? <laughs> He's redeveloping my conscience. I walked over my conscience so many times, there's not even a line there anymore. But God is rebuilding it. Because he is faithful. He's going to permeate. The Bible says he's the author. And he's the perfecter of our faith in Hebrews chapter 12. Those who are born of his spirit, God is going to work and he's going to move and accomplish his great purpose. That's why James says rejoice in those trials because they must come because perseverance must have its perfect work. God is doing something. Jesus said this, the spirit of truth, this world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him for he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. I'm so thankful. <laughs> I'm so thankful because it's not about me or my willpower. And when I was that 18-year-old suicidal kid, I just cried out, if you're out there, and if there is a Jesus, I just give my life to you. And my life has never been the same in spite of me because that yeast of the Holy Spirit was planted into this lump of dough. Amen? How good is our God? How faithful. I love this verse, this story in Acts chapter 4. You might know the story. They were being persecuted for their faith in Christ, these new believers. And they gathered together in verse 29, and, and they prayed, and they said this, Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform miraculous signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. Listen, these were spirit-filled, devoted followers of Jesus. But after they prayed, they were refreshed and anointed and immersed in the power of the Holy Spirit. And he wants to do that again and again and again. Not just a one-time infilling that we just say, okay, now I've got that, I'll go on and live my life. No, it's that relationship that depends and calls on the Spirit of God continually to refresh to restore, to empower, so we can live that life that God designed us to live. We can speak the word of God boldly to other people. We can stand in this world where the kingdom is seemingly invisible and yet is all over. We can stand confidently because the Spirit of God is empowering us. Now what about you? I'm always reminded of the parable of the sower and the seed. Once again, the gospel is presented as this little seed. Right? This little seed. 
And he says some of that seed fell on a hardened path. But the, and the birds were able to come and snatch it up. And it was Satan taking away that seed before it had a chance to germinate. He said some fell on a, on a rocky soil. There was a, a, a rock shelf with a shallow amount of soil. And, and the seed fell in there. And it grew up quickly. But when persecution came and things got tough, the sun came out, in other words, dried up that seed because the roots couldn't go past this rock. Many of us have those rock shelves in our life. God needs to break through that rock. God desires to break up that rocky soil so those roots can go deep. What are those strongholds in your life? What is that woundedness in your life? What is that skepticism, cynicism? What is that in your life, that unbelief, a shelf of hard things that have hardened you that you need to say, God, Break up that shell. Holy Spirit of God within me, move and break through in a deeper way so I can know all that you have in your will for my life. He says, some of it fell among thorns. And those thorns represent the cares of the world, world that come and they just choke you. The, the Spirit of God, choke it out. So he can't have his way in your life. Maybe you need to say, Lord, I want to I surrender those things. Your kingdom is unstoppable, and I, I need to just surrender to it and let you have your way. And then finally, of course, the last fell on that good ground. And the Spirit of God was able, that seed was able to grow and permeate and go deep and accomplish all God desired. Would you all stand? I'm going to ask the elders and the pastors to come down. I want you to bow your heads today. I want to encourage you today. I want you to see this amazing kingdom of God.